I guess we can move on to mix up. It's really successful technique for data augmentation. And the cool thing about it is that it is data agnostic. We know that data augmentation is really helpful for regularizing large neural networks and the regularization is happening at the input layer, even before any layers are constructed from your neural network. And its role is to, for instance, double the size of your data, triple the size of your data, or five times bigger. And the bigger your data set, the happier is gonna be your neural network. And then the cool thing is this is data agnostic. Data agnostic means uh, it doesn't care whether you're working with images. It doesn't care whether you're working with text or speech or any other sorts of data, graphs. But we are gonna see it in the context of images. We are gonna see it's like this. But later on, this is a useful technique to have in mind. Like dropout, it's a useful technique or batch normalization. The other one is mix up. At the same time, you're gonna hear the word empirical risk minimization a lot. It's just a fancy word for what we have been doing so far in the course in our loss functions. What, why, what, where does the name come from? Why empirical? What is risk? And minimization should be clear. In machine learning, you like to minimize. Usually you have a function, for instance, when you were doing your classification, you had a function that would take as input an image and it's gonna output the corresponding class or the corresponding probability distribution over multiple classes. So that's your function. And you can parameterize it. And if you parameterize it, it's going to give you a family of functions. But then from that family, you're looking for only one of them. That's why you do, you minimize something. You can say that your data are X. You can think of them as random feature vectors. In this case, your features are your pixels or actually the tensor images. And you can think of your output as another random variable or another random vector, which are your classes maybe one, two, three, up until K. But now we are thinking of them as random variables, as random vectors. It means that you can put a distribution on top of them. And then your data are just realizations of these random variables. You're sampling from this distribution to generate data. And they are identical samples from this distribution. It means that they have the same distribution and they are independent. So your observations are independently sampled from this distribution. And then you're gonna write a loss function, which is gonna say that if I sample a pair of X and Y from my distribution, it should give me the loss function, should give you or penalize you for making the wrong predictions for F of X being different from your actual target. So that's the role of your loss function. And as you can see, I'm trying to keep everything general because we are going to later on apply it to other types of data and other types of distributions. So the loss function is something that is going to penalize you or penalize your model for making the wrong predictions. You have a capital P, that's your joint distribution. Now you can define your expected risk. How risky is it if you use the wrong function from this family, if you use the wrong uh, predictions? or predictor, what's gonna happen? What is the risk? How do you define it? You look at your loss on some of data, pairs of data, X and Y, you're making some mistake. How much mistake you're making, your loss function is gonna tell you that. And then you keep sampling from your distribution, your joint distribution on your data. That's your risk. How much risky is this function? What is the problem? In practice, P is unknown. Only nature knows. What we can do is just sample from P, and that's going to be our data. In a perfect scenario, in a perfect world, somebody would give P, and then we would compute this integral uh, by hand analytically, and we would be happy. We would know what is the risk of this function. But the big problem is that P is unknown. We can only sample from it. That's your data. And uh, the other problem is even if you know P, that's gonna be a complex distribution on your images, which are high dimensional. And the dimension of an image is its height times width times three, red, green, blue. 
So it's going to be H times W times 3. So these are high dimensional data. And we know that computing integrals in high dimension is not easy. Anyways, even if you know P, you have Monte Carlo. But we don't know P to begin with. So that's one less problem. But what you can do is sample from P, or somebody gives you this sample from some P, and that's your training data. And these are just samples from your P. These are IID samples. You have N of them. That's the size of your training data. And then you can define something that is called empirical distribution. What is that? Whenever you have a data, an image, the corresponding label, this delta function is going to have a value of 1. Otherwise, it's going to have a value of 0. As you do this summation over your data, that's going to give you a probability distribution over your space. Most of the times, this is 0. Whenever you have a data, it's going to be a 1. So it's going to be a lot of pins coming uh, outside of your plane. So that's your distribution. That's the empirical distribution. Now let's take a look at this integral. So far, so good. Let's replace P by P delta, because this distribution is most of the time zero, except whenever you have a data, that integral is going to turn into a summation. This one over n, you still have it. And then you are just evaluating your loss function. And this should be familiar to you. This is exactly what we have been doing so far. This was our loss function. It's the average of the losses we are incurring on our data. So nothing is fancy here. Maybe the notation is a little bit fancy, but conceptually speaking, you're just averaging the losses that you're making. And that's called empirical because empirical corresponds to observations because you don't know the analytical form of your P. Okay, so far so good. The observation that we're gonna make is that P delta is not the only distribution that you can work with. There are a million other distributions to work with, including, uh, for instance, vicinal risk minimization. What is that? You want to write a distribution over your pair of inputs, x and y, or x tilde and y tilde. You can just call them x and y. That's fine. You look at your data. Wherever you have a data in that neighborhood, you try to smooth out this empirical distribution. So this empirical distribution was uh, not a smooth. These are just Dirac delta function. These are like pins coming out of the plane. Now you're trying to smooth things out. How do you smooth it? One option is this. I guess if I start with an example, that's going to be more clear. You look at your X or X tilde. If it is close to one of your images in the training data, and it's in the vicinity of sigma squared, uh, you're going to be fine. It's going to have a value. And we know that the normal distribution is going to go to zero whenever you're away from your mean. And mean, in this case, is your xi. So if x tilde is close to xi, to one of your data, it's going to have the biggest value. Your normal distribution is going to have a peak. Otherwise, it's going to go to zero exponentially fast. So this is, don't think of this as a distribution. Think of this as exponential of negative of x tilde minus xi squared divided by 2 sigma squared and some coefficients, maybe 1 over square root of 2 pi in front of your exponential. But the idea is that as soon as you're in the vicinity of one of your data, you're going to take a higher value. Your distribution is going to take a higher value. Otherwise, it's going to be 0. And this one is still your delta Dirac. If you're at a label, uh, that's your value. And this should be fine, because we know that when you're doing classification, you have finitely many choices. You have k classes. So that should be fine. This other one is a continuous distribution. So there is a question about x tilde and y tilde. They're going to become clear. The same way that uh, p was a little bit abstract when I was explaining it, things are going to become more clear as soon as I explain more. You're going to know what is x tilde and y tilde. But for now, you're writing a distribution over your entire space. And your entire space uh, are pairs of x and y. And as soon as x and y are close to your data, this distribution new is going to take a higher value. Otherwise, it's just 0. So this is just a smooth approximation to your empirical distribution. OK, let's continue. I will take a look at the chat a little bit later. But for now, things are abstract. 
but things are going to become clear soon. What are you actually doing? You have your image, input image. What is happening in practice when you use vCNL risk minimization? What is actually happening? You take your image, you add a little bit of Gaussian noise to it, and then you push it through your model. You push it through your function f to get the corresponding label. So x tilde is just a perturbation of your input image. You perturb it by Gaussian noise. So I guess this should answer your question. Can you explain what x tilde and y tilde are? At least x tilde is just a small perturbation of your input data. And that's how you're augmenting it. So there is another question. Can you actually sample multiple x tilde per each data point? Of course. So now you can increase the size of your data as much as you want. But we are not done yet. This is not mix up. This is the fact that if you use another distribution to approximate your underlying distribution, you are going to end up with just adding Gaussian noise to your images. And that is the idea of, you can call it vCNL data augmentation or Gaussian noise data augmentation. Okay, so we are not done yet. Okay, so it, all it boils down to is choosing a good approximation for your P. Here, P delta was really discrete. Here, you're smoothing things out a little bit. So smoother approximation to your probability. And then as soon as you do this, in fact, what you are actually optimizing over is that you take your input image, you perturb it, the corresponding image you perturb it a little bit, but here, because this is just a delta Dirac function, you are not perturbing your labels, you're only perturbing your images, you write down your loss, M is now gonna be different from N because you just increase the size of your data and then you can minimize that risk. So what is mix up? What are you doing? It's just another mu, another distribution. So you're having, previously you had the empirical distribution. You can have vCNL distribution or empirical vCNL distribution. Now you can have mix up. Mathematically, it might confuse you. What are you actually doing? You, pair, you take a pair of data, xi and xj. So you take two images in your data set. You linearly combine them. You look at the line between these two images. It's gonna end up being an image in between. Maybe this is the image of a dog. That's the image of a cat. As soon as you linearly combine them, or it's a convex combination, because lambda is a value from zero to one, you're creating an image of a dog cat. So that's what it is. So this is a convex combination of the two. And then you do the same thing to your label. The label is no more a cat, it's no more a dog, it's gonna be somewhere in between. So you need to adjust the label as well. Okay, so far so good. Then that's just more data. You have your Delta Dirac on those data, and then you can have multiple choices for Lambda. And whenever you have multiple choices for something, you can just uh, keep an average of them. And that's gonna give you a new distribution. The question is, how do you choose lambda? You choose it from a beta distribution. Even lambda is chosen randomly. If you have alpha to be zero, you're gonna recover your empirical risk minimization. So you're gonna recover this loss function here. Otherwise, it's a generalization. And you have multiple choices. Alpha is a hyperparameter in your loss function. If alpha is, for instance, one over four, you are giving a high value to the endpoints, and the endpoints are actually your data. And that's why as alpha goes to zero, you're gonna get back your empirical risk. If alpha is one half, it's a little bit higher in between. If alpha is exactly one, you're gonna get the uniform distribution. If alpha is two, that's gonna be your distribution. If alpha is four, you're gonna be focusing more on, on the image between a dog and a cat. And then this ERM, versus mix up with different values for your mix up parameter, they're gonna give you different uh, top one and top five error. And it's a case that always having mix up helps because it's a data augmentation technique, regardless of your network. Let it be ResNet, ResNext with different depth. I guess I'm gonna stop here. And uh, for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. And for those of you who have questions, and want to stay, I'll be around. So any questions about this? I just want to say this is really cool. Yep, so the idea so far, we were focusing mostly on the architecture, 
how to design your architecture. Now you're looking at your last function and how to design it. At the same time, you're thinking about uh, what you're actually minimizing. And as you can see, Lambda, you can choose as many of them as you want. And then all you need to do is look at pairs of images in your mini batch and then do a convex combination of them. Let me talk about the last function that's still the, the cross entropy, right? Yes. So this L depends on the data, for instance, in the case of images, that's going to be your cross entropy, or it could be the negative of the log of your likelihood. It's the same thing. Gotcha. For classification, that's what you do. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. There is a question. Are there any tricky assumptions we are making about the data that might not be really true? Uh, maybe that's not a good assumption mix up. Maybe vicinal risk minimization is not a good assumption. Maybe empirical risk is not a good assumption, but these are the assumptions that you're making. In the perfect scenario, you would know P and then you would know how to integrate it. But uh, that's just never going to happen. You're always going to have some data. What I'm saying here is that working with empirical distribution is mathematically as good as working with this Gaussian vicinity distribution and mathematically as good as using any other distribution, including mixup. Now you need to look at it empirically on different problems. And you can see that mixup is actually helping most of your architectures train better. Uh, for now, in terms of the slides you need to watch next, uh, I'm going to be covering mixup, uh, large mini batch stochastic gradient descent, and residual attention for the next few sessions but then you can watch Squeeze and Excitation Network. So for a while, I'm gonna be busy with covering and then you're gonna have less work to do. Okay, so there are only three more slides that you can watch from this chapter. Okay, any other questions?